So in today's example, we're going to cover how to visualize comparisons using ggplot. Um, we'll specifically cover how to make spark lines and small multiples and slope graphs. Um, and we're going to use data directly from the internet rather than downloading some CSV file and importing that. Um, there are packages that let you interface with different websites and different uh, data services. So today we're going to download some data directly from the World Bank rather than using Gapminder data or finding some other data set online. Um, and then we'll visualize some comparisons with it. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, if we switch to our studio, um, what we're going to do is create a new project just like we've been doing um, every day this, this semester here. So we're going to go to File, New Project, New Directory. We're going to create a new project. I'm going to stick it on my desktop and we'll just call it Comparisons. That works. And we're going to create it in a new session just so I can keep my other RStudio open um, that I have open from other things. I think that's the course website. So we should have a new project here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the desktop folder where I made that new project. And I'm going to add a new folder in here and I'm going to call it data, just like we've been doing, but I'm not going to put anything in it. I'm just going to leave it empty. We'll have an empty data folder that we can do stuff with. Um, so if we switch back to RStudio, um, you can see now we have um, our files panel um, that is pointed at the right folder. It's a desktop comparisons. If you check up at the top of the console area, you can also see that R is pointed at the right place. And so that's good. Um, everything should be ready to go. So we're going to create a new R Markdown file for all of our analysis. So if we go to File, New File, R Markdown, we'll just hit Enter. And we'll call this Comparisons. And we'll just leave all of that. If we select from line 7 all the way down and delete it, then we should be good to go. And we have an empty R Markdown file ready. Um, we'll save it. And we'll call it... Um, Comparisons. Okay, so we have our comparisons, our markdown file, and that's where we're going to be doing all of our editing. Um, so ordinarily, again, this would be a very narrative document. You would have some sort of introduction explaining what you're doing here. We're talking about comparisons, and we want to learn all about fun stuff. That's what those that text there stands for. Um, but then we're going to have a section called Get Data. So in the past, we've been using read CSV to load a CSV file. Um, you've also read an Excel file using read Excel if you load the read Excel package. Um, what we're going to do today is something slightly different. And we're going to insert a chunk still. Um, and we want to use uh, tidyverse. We're going to say library tidyverse. And because I know that tidyverse generates lots of warnings and messages, um, it's a very talkative package. We're going to turn those off here. So we're going to say load libraries data. We're going to name that chunk because that's good practice. And then we're going to say warning equals false and message equals false. So that way it's not super talkative when we're working with this. Um, what we're going to do to get the data, the World Bank, if you go to data.worldbank.org, they have this whole open data portal where you can search for all sorts of things. So if you want to search for population, for example, um, we can look at the population total. And if we look at it, here's the population total for the whole world. Um, but then they should have it divided out by different countries. You can scroll down. You can see Afghanistan's population is 18 million. Um, Algeria is 20 million, um, etc. So we're gonna, what we're going to do is get data directly from the World Bank's page here. We could click on CSV here, and then we could put that into R. But it doesn't always come as nice, tidy data. Um, where each country has its own row and then there's a column for population. Um, that's not always the case with this World Bank data. It comes in different forms and it's a hassle to work with, especially if you want to download like 10 different indicators. You have to come here and download 10 different CSV files and then stitch them all together in R, and that's kind of a hassle. So what we're going to do is download stuff directly from um, the World Bank. And there's an R package that lets us do this. It's called, so if we say library, it's called WDI in all caps. That stands for World Development Indicators. Um, that used to be, or that's, that's one subset of data that the World Bank has is they have specific World Development Indicators. 
Um, this website was originally just for the WDI scores and then they expanded it to a whole bunch of other measures, but the package is still called WDI. And so if we load these two libraries, we'll load Tidyverse and WDI. Um, what we have now is a new function called WDI. And if you look at the documentation for it in this tooltip, or if you don't have the tooltip, you can come to the help file and search for WDI, is we can feed this WDI function a list of countries, or we can just say all, and it'll get all of the countries in the World Bank's data. We can feed it a list of indicators. So if you see here the default indicators, this NYGNS, ICTR, GNZS cryptic code thing there, what that is, is that's the World Bank's internal uh, data ID. So if you go back to this World Bank page, um, you'll notice up here, the URL says data.worldbank.org slash indicator slash, and then it has this sp.pop.total female. Um, if we copy that, that is the official code for this variable. So if we want the total female population in a country, that's the indicator we want. And so we can just copy that and paste that into R and then we will download that specific variable. We can feed it a whole bunch of different variables. Um, by default, I think this is GDP. Um, I can't remember, it's something. Um, and so we can actually feed it a list of multiple things and it'll grab them all. Um, there's other arguments you can include. You can include a start year, you can include an end year. And then there's this, this argument called extra where if you have this true, then it'll get a whole bunch of other columns like the continent, um, the World Bank's official um, income levels, um, and other extra variables that get thrown in there just that you can use for different analyses. And so I like to turn that on just to get extra stuff. So the way this works is we want to create a new object. So we're gonna say WDI underscore raw. And it, this is important where we do this raw versus clean idea because sometimes it takes a little while for the data to come from the, the World Bank servers, especially if you're getting lots of variables. And so if you just have like one main WDI data set and you want to add a new column, you don't wanna keep running this WDI function because that's gonna take forever um, every time you want to add a column or filter or do something. And so what I like to do is I get the data originally from the World Bank, save that as an object, and then I make a copy of it, and then that's where I do my mutating and filtering and grouping and everything else. So we're gonna make an object called WDI raw, and we'll use um, the WDI function for that. So we want country equals all, so we want all the countries. Um, we can say indicator equals, we could give it a single value, we could give it like female population there. We can also give it a list of values. And what I like to do is I like to put a list of values kind of outside of there. That way I can control it better. I can comment it out and remember what all the codes mean. Um, so I'm gonna grab some code from the course website of some variables that I pre-looked up. So if we paste that here, so you'll notice here I'm making an object called indicators and it's gonna be a list of these four different things here. Uh, life expectancy, access to electricity, CO2 emissions, and GDP per capita. Those were just random ones that I decided to look at at the World Bank's website, and I got their codes here. So if we run just this line, you'll notice we have a new um, variable over here that has four elements to it, and it's those four codes. Um, and then I have these comments here just so I remember what these things mean. So here where we say indicator equals, we're just gonna say indicators because that's the name of that object that we created. Um, we can change the start year. So we're gonna start this in 1995 and we're gonna end it in 2015. Um, I think it goes up to like 2018 or 2019 at this point. I don't know how long it takes for them to get you know, the most recent data in there. It actually shows here um, like Afghanistan female population, most recent year is 2018. So we could go up to there, but we'll just stick with like a 20 year span um, and go 95 to 2015. And we want to get those extra columns just for fun. So we'll say extra equals true. So if I run this now, it's going to um, communicate through the internet behind the scenes with the World Bank's um, server. And then it's going to collect all of these indicators that we want. And then it's going to bring them back into R. And so we're just going to wait. And that went fairly quickly. When I did this right before, it took like almost a minute, um, but this only took a few seconds, which was nice. 
And so now if we click on WDI raw, you can see all of the stuff that we just got. We have a column for the ISO country code. Um, we have a column for the country name for year. Here's our um, indicators, life expectancy, access to electricity, etc. We have the ISO 3 code, and then we have the capital of the country. We have geographic information. We have income levels, um, a whole bunch of other stuff that's all there that just came directly from the World Bank. Um, so what we're going to do now is with that WDI raw, um, we're going to clean it up. And we're going to make a new data set called WDI clean. Um, and what we're going to do, actually, we're not going to do that quite yet. Because I've been teaching you all about reproducible research. And we want to document everything that we're doing. And we want to include the code that we're using in the document. The problem with this, though, is if I knit this document right now, if I press Command Shift K to knit this to HTML, it will it will replicate and it'll reproduce everything in here, but it will communicate with the World Bank's servers again, and it might take a while. And then if you change something and knit again, it will have to download that data again from the internet. And we don't want to do that over and over and over and over again. Um, so what I like to do is I like to save this WDI raw data to my computer so that then I have a copy of it and I don't have to keep getting it from the internet and it speeds up knitting. Um, so what we can do is we can say write underscore CSV. We've been using read CSV to read it in. Now we're going to write a CSV file. So we're going to write the WDI raw file and we're going to put it in that data folder that we made and we'll just call it data slash WDI raw dot CSV. So if I run that line now, and if I come look in Finder, you'll see that we have a new CSV file there um, with all of the World Bank data that we just downloaded, but as a nice spreadsheet right there. So we have a spreadsheet version of it um, that we can share with other people and use in other programs, and that's neat. Okay, so we've saved the CSV file here. That's good. Um, so that means if we close R and open it again, we can actually just read that CSV file in and not go through all of this WDI stuff. But we want to document what we did here with this WDI stuff. We don't want to throw away that code. We want other people to be able to run this. So what I like to do is I like to separate all of this, um, getting the data from the internet and then saving it to my computer. Um, I like to move it to a different chunk. So I'm going to select that code and cut it. And so we're going to make a new chunk right here. And we're going to put it in that chunk. And so we're going to name this get data. But the one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make it so that this chunk actually doesn't run. If you go into the chunk options, there's a setting to turn off the evaluation of the chunk, or we can say eval equals false. So that means it's still going to include this code in the document. And so when you knit it, you'll be able to see it. But you're not actually going to run this code. So if I knit this thing now, um, it's knitting. There it goes. So it's loading the libraries, and then it is just not doing the WDI grabbing thing. And so if we look at the document, we should see here's the data that we got, or here's the, the packages that we loaded. Here's the code for getting the data, but none of this actually ran. This just happened behind, like, it's just showing the code there, but nothing actually ran. And so where that gets kind of confusing is if later we have chunks that clean up this WDI raw data and do stuff with it and start making plots, that's not going to happen now because we told this chunk to not run. And so what we need to do is add another chunk in here that actually loads this CSV file so that we can then do stuff with it. So if we come down below and add a new chunk, we can call this one load data for real. And if we want to be like super secretive about this, we can actually say include equals false. So it will still run this chunk, but it won't put it in the document. And so in here, we can take, uh, we can say WDI raw equals read CSV data slash WDI, WDI raw dot CSV. So this, if I run this, this will load the CSV file from the computer. Um, if I knit this thing, it's going to go from the beginning, run all of the chunks. It's skipping this chunk, so it's not actually getting anything from the internet. 
but it's still going to run this right here. It's still going to run this, the read CSV version here. And as a result, the knitted document should look like we actually pulled everything from the internet. Um, and then we could continue. Now we have a thing called WDIRAW that we can work with, but you can't actually see where we read it as a CSV file. So it's kind of a tricky way of, of getting stuff from the internet, making it look like we're actually getting it. And we did, and we recorded that onto the computer. But then when we actually do the analysis, we're going to use the, the CSV version of it and load that in. So that's kind of a fun little trick that we can do. Um, so now we want to clean this data a little bit um, to make it easier to work with. There are a couple problems with the data. First, it has these awful names. Um, I have like, if we're going to be plotting life expectancy a lot, I don't want to type sp.dyn.whatever that is. Um, that's a mess. Another issue we have here is this doesn't actually include only countries. It does aggregate stuff. And so we have rows for the Arab world as a country. And if we scroll down, we have rows for the world as a country and East Asia and Pacific and a whole bunch of other things. We want to get rid of those. We just want actual countries. And conveniently, if we scroll all the way to the side, um, there's this category here for region that gives us what continent these different countries are in. But notice how this region is aggregates. And so if we can filter the data to get rid of all of these aggregate countries, um, then all we're going to be left with are actual countries. And so if we look here, now we have a region called East Asia and Pacific and we're good. So that's what we need to do. We need to filter it so that we get rid of all those aggregates. And then we need to rename some of those columns so that they're easier to work with. So we're going to add a new chunk and we're going to call this um, clean data. So we're going to make a new object called WDI clean, which is based on WDI raw. Um, the first thing we want to do is filter. So let's move this down a little bit so you can see this better. So we want to say filter. Um, that column name was called region. We want it. We want every row where region is not equal to aggregates. And that was the value for all of those aggregate um, fake countries. So now if we run it and we look at WDI clean, we can even see here that we've lost like a thousand rows. We used to have 5,500, now we have 4,500. And the data now starts with Andorra, which is a country, instead of Arab world, which is not a country, it's the whole region for the Arab world. So that's good. We've got that fixed. So if we come back to WDI clean, we can add another pipe. And we want to rename some columns here. Um, and to save typing, I'm actually just going to grab these things from here because I don't want to type all of those codes, um, the World Bank code. So this is what we're renaming. We're making, we're, we're changing this SPDYN thing to life expectancy. Excess electricity equals that thing, CO2 emissions equals that thing, and GDP per capita equals that thing. So now if we run it and we look at WDI clean, we have much nicer columns with access to electricity, CO2 emissions, GDP per capita. We don't have any aggregate things. So we have a nice clean data set of just countries in the world. So we're ready to do things with it. We can start visualizing it. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make some small multiples. Because this is an easy way to compare lots of trends in lots of different countries simultaneously, um, as we talked about in the lecture for today. And so um, what we're going to do is make a smaller data set, because um, we could theoretically plot like all 180 countries or whatever. Let's figure out how many countries there are just for fun. So down in the console, I'm going to type WDI clean. And then we're going to say count or yeah, count country. So there, are, so there's 21 rows of data. There's 216 countries in this data set. Um, so that's that's a lot to work with. We don't want to plot all 216 things all at once. That's that's a lot. Um, so what we can do is make a smaller version of the data set and then plot and make some comparisons across a handful of countries. So we're going to add a new chunk, and this is going to we're going to name this to be good, responsible coders. This is going to be our small multiples. So what we want to do is make a smaller data set first. So we're going to just call this WDI smaller. This is going to be based on WDI clean, but we're going to filter it a little bit. 
Um, there are lots of different ways we could filter it. We could choose a specific continent and we can compare all of the countries, the life expectancy um, of a whole bunch of different countries in one specific region. Um, we can give it a list of a handful of countries and look at those. Um, so we're going to do that for fun because why not? So we're going to say filter. Um, so we're going to say we only want some countries. We're going to say country. And rather than doing one of those complicated filter so that country is equal to Canada or country is equal to something else or country is equal to something else because that's really tedious. We can tell it to look for, look to see if the country is in a list of countries. And we do that with this percent in percent symbol. And then we can give it a list. So what we can say is only choose the rows where the country is um, Argentina and Bolivia, and Brazil, and Chile, and Canada, and Belize. So notice how all of those start with like A and B and C. Um, that's because I, I chose these because I was scrolling through the list and I didn't want to scroll down too far and those are the countries I thought of. Um, you can choose whatever countries you want, you just have to make sure that they match. Um, so like some of the countries it might say something like Bolivia um, and that's the official name that's in here. Um, if it's like UAE, you want to actually write out United Arab Emirates. You want to have it match whatever's in here. So sometimes like with Egypt, I think um, it says like Egypt uh, Republic of or something. What does it say? Yeah, it says Egypt Arab, Arab Republic. So if I want to get Egypt, I have to use that exact phrasing there um, for the filtering. Or I can use the country code and I can say filter so that the country code is in a list of specific country codes, either this two character one EG or the three character one EGY. Um, and that would work and then I wouldn't have to worry about exactly how they're spelling the countries. Um, these are all fairly straightforward, so it works. Okay, so if we run this now, we should have a data set that only has like 120 rows in it called WDI smaller and it is just those six countries that we chose. So that was fairly easy. Now we want to plot life expectancy in each of these six countries so we can compare um, how life expectancy is growing across all six of the countries. So to do that, we're going to use ggplot. We're going to say data equals our smaller data set, WDI smaller. Our mapping, we're going to say AES. So on the x-axis, we want year because we want to see how life expectancy is changing over time. On our y-axis, we want life expectancy. So if we look, um, if I can remember what we called it, it's life underscore expectancy. So we're going to say life underscore expectancy. Okay, and we want to plot this with a line. So we'll say geom line. And if we just plot that, we should get a nice picture of that. So this is a good sign that um, we forgot to add a different aesthetic. Um, this is showing all six life expectant or all six countries' life expectancies in each year, and so it's trying to connect all those dots. And so that's why you have this diagonal thing because it's going from the last country in 1995 to the first country in 1996. So that's bad. Um, we can fix that either by saying like color equals country. Now we should have six different lines. Hopefully. There we go. Now we have six different lines. That's good. Or instead of coloring or in addition to coloring, we can facet. So we're going to say facet wrap. And the variables we're going to use are just the country. So if we plot that now, we should get six different countries um, in a nice little grid here. And that is how you make small multiples. The whole idea of small multiples is just making little plots that you can compare trends in. Um, and so here we have a small multiples example with six different plots. Um, we can make it more minimalist if we want to be super fancy um, because um, technically one story that we can tell, we could tell a story of like, here's the actual life expectancies in these countries. Canada started off really high and they've been going up slowly. Belize had a little drop down and now they're kind of in the middle. Bolivia started really low and they kind of climbed up to the middle. And so you can tell kind of more detailed stories here. But if you have like 40 different countries that you're trying to show the small multiples for, um, you don't necessarily need all of the information. 
Um, and this is Edward Tufte's idea here, where you can actually, like, the main part of the story you care about is the shape of these lines. You want to see countries where there's a dip or where something wrong happened or something right happened. Um, and so what you want to really emphasize is the slopes of these lines. And so to do that, we can actually just like use theme void, which will turn off all theme elements except the titles of the panels. And so now we just have these very minimalist lines here. Um, and so this highlights the sizes of the, or the, the slopes of the lines and the shapes of the lines. Um, we can make these lines a little bit thicker so we can see the differences better or so we can highlight the lines better. So now it's size equals one. Now we get these kind of worm thingies here. Um, one thing Edward Tufte does, and I've seen in other places, but like Klaus Wilkie actually says don't do this. Um, we can make it so all of these y axes um, have their, or each panel has its own y axis. Right now they all have a shared y axis, and that's why Canada's way up here and Bolivia starts down there. Um, and so back before we did this um, theme void, you could actually see, so let's run this, well, let's run this without the theme void. So you can see the numbers on here. So if you look at the y-axis here, um, every panel in here has the same y-axis, starting at 60, going up to 80. But if we add an argument in facet wrap and say scales equals, and then in quotes, if we say free underscore y, what that will do is it will give each panel its own y-axis. And so there it is. So for Argentina, it starts at 73, goes to 76. Canada starts at 78, goes to 82. And so everything is kind of taking up the full panel here, um, which is bad from one perspective because now like Canada kind of has the same trajectory as all of these other countries, um, even though it's a smaller slope. Um, they start at 78 and 82. They're not starting at like 60 and ending at 70. That's a much bigger journey than the four years um, those 10 years there. But the slope is still constant. There's no big dips. Um, with Belize, there's a big dip there. And that's kind of emphasizing the dip. And so it is kind of lying with data. But to kind of get rid of that temptation to lie with the data, this is where taking all of the grid lines off completely works really well. Because now um, we just have the different shapes of these different countries. So again, what we can do, if we just glance at this, we'll say Argentina, Brazil, Canada, Chile, and Bolivia, they've all just kind of been trending upwards at a fairly constant rate. Um, it might be a faster constant rate in the case of Bolivia, slower constant rate in, um, in Canada, but we can't really tell a difference there. But we do see the story of Belize there where there was a dip and then they went up. And so then we can tell something about Belize and dig into the data more and figure out what actually happened in Belize to cause that dip and to cause that rise. Um, and so that's that's how you do small multiples. You just show a whole bunch of smaller graphs and you can make comparisons across them. Um, so small multiples, check. Um, we can, just to highlight this, we'll do one more small multiples just for fun. Um, because this is only six countries, but we wanna do a whole bunch of countries. So we will copy this same code here and come down and we'll add a new chunk and we'll do a whole region. Um, we'll do the Middle East because there are 21 countries in the Middle East in this data set. And so that makes a nice grid. We can have it be three by seven um, and it'll fit in a rectangle. So we're going to make a chunk here called Middle East North Africa Life Expectancy. We're going to paste the code here. Um, we could overwrite this WDI smaller data set, um, but it's kind of good practice to not overwrite things that you are still using. Like we use WDI smaller up here. We don't want to make a new version of WDI smaller down here. So we can just call this one WDI MENA, Middle East, North Africa. So here, instead of filtering and saying country is one of these things, we could type all 21 of the countries, but that's miserable. So we're going to say instead region equals Middle East and North Africa. And they use the ampersand in the data set. And I know that because I, I looked beforehand. Um, you have to make sure that it matches. So like Europe ampersand Central Asia, you can't write the and or else it's not going to work. Okay, so if we run this, now we should have a smaller data set called WDI MENA with 441 rows now. Um, we can leave all of the other code the same. Well, 
we don't want to plot WDI smaller, we want to do WDI mina, but then leave everything else the same. And now if we plot it, we should get 21 little tiny plots with different shapes here. Um, it didn't fit it into a nice rectangle. And we have this Yemen just kind of off by itself. But if you count up the number of plots here, we have one, two, three, four, five times one, two, three, four. So that's 21. So inside facet wrap, we can actually say either n row equals three or n call equals seven. Or if we want it to be a tall rectangle, we can switch those. So now if we do this, we should get a three by seven grid of life expectancies. There it is. Okay, um, it's kind of squished here. Um, you can change the dimensions. If you come into the, the chunk options, you can have it be a much wider and skinnier um, plot size. Or if we click on this little icon here, we can pop out the visualization and have it be in a separate window, which we can then resize. And so here is our plot. And sometimes the text looks goofy. So if you just rearrange it, it will redraw the text. So here we can see again, different stories of life expectancy. Um, we've shrunk them all down so that they fit, or shrunk all the scales down so they're all on, they all have their own y-axis, which could be bad. Um, but again, we're just telling a story here of weird changes in life expectancy in these different countries. So you see Syria, um, they've had kind of a hard time. Um, Iraq has had a hard time. Um, they've recently recovered, but here's the US invasion. Here's the Syrian revolution. Libya had a hard time right here. Um, so you can kind of tell different stories just looking at this really briefly. Um, you can map other things onto here. You don't, you could have these colored by um, subregions and have like just North Africa be one color, just the Middle East be a different, or Southwest Asia be a different color. I mean, you can do other things. But this is kind of a super minimalist quick view of um, life expectancy in the region, which is kind of cool. Um, instead of faceting everything and just having it be in a rectangle, one really cool package that you should experiment with, um, I won't show it in this demonstration. There's a, an example of it on the course website version of this example. Um, there's a package called GeoFacet. And what this lets you do is actually arrange your facets um, into the shape of a map instead of just having a rectangle. So like this example at the top of their website here is the shape of the United States. And so you can see unemployment um, throughout all of the different states. And I had this example in the lecture. And so we saw that North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana weren't very affected by the Great Recession in 2008, but other places were like Nevada, California, and Florida. Um, but this was created just by using um, a function that came with it called, um, I think it's, yeah, facet geo. And so then you can do all sorts of plots within a state grid. So here's the United States state grid. It's a slightly different one. It puts Hawaii and Alaska down in the bottom corner. Um, this one puts Hawaii and Alaska where they actually are, kind of. So Alaska up there, Hawaii down there. It comes with a whole bunch of different um, grids. If you scroll down in their example code, it shows here's the European Union. Um, and that this is the example we have on the course website for today. Um, they have a big list of grids that people have made. So like Indian states and Mexican states and um, counties and um, Swiss cantons and a whole bunch of other things. You can actually create your own too. They have a website where you can like drag tiles around and create whatever layout you want. Um, so here's this, this grid designer here. And so if you don't want Washington there and you want Washington over by Washington, D.C., you can just drag that, that tile over there and then it will generate the code that you need to use to lay the facets out in this shape. And you can make them whatever shape you want and do all sorts of cool stuff. Um, so like here's Australia. Um, that's where the different um, provinces in Australia are. Tasmania off by itself. South Africa is shaped like that. So you can do all sorts of like really cool things here. Um, dental health in Scotland, that's neat. So I would, I would recommend checking out the GeoFacet package um, because it lets you do cool small multiple things, um, but in a way that communicates more information than just sticking everything in a grid. It communicates geographic information. So it's easier to find um, specific countries 
instead of just having kind of an alphabetical rectangle um, because we're generally familiar with maps. So check that out. It's really cool. Okay, so that's how you do small multiples. Next thing we're going to do is spark lines. And so a spark line, if you remember from the lecture, is really just a small line that shows something about data. It doesn't have to be a line. It can also be a tiny histogram or a tiny bar chart or a whole bunch of tiny dots. Um, but the idea behind the spark line is that it's roughly the size of your text. Um, and it's it, it's kind of the same shape and size as a word, and it can substitute in for a word, or it can supplement words that are in your text. Um, doing this with R is a little bit tricky. It's hard to get tiny pictures into our studio or into an R markdown file and get them to knit consistently. Um, like with HTML, you can put like an inline graphic and you can tell it to be a certain number of pixels tall and a certain number of pixels wide and it will work. Um, if you look at the course website, um, for the example for today, this is what it looks like here. Um, you'll notice I have, it says both India and then it shows the line and China and it shows that line have seen increased CO2, emission, CO2 emissions. That only worked because I hand coded the HTML um, picture in there. If I knit this document to PDF, um, you have to do latex or latex fancy way of inserting inline graphics. Um, if you're going to do it in Word, I don't know how well it works when you knit to Word. So generally with these sparkline things, this is where you'd want to include it manually. Um, like if you have kind of a, a company report and you've done all of the analysis and everybody's typing kind of in a shared Google Doc or in like an official Word document, then you can just like drag these pictures in by hand. So it's less reproducible, but ultimately kind of, this is kind of more of more, more on the polishing end of creating documents instead of um, kind of generating the actual pictures. So um, it's, it's harder to do this in R Markdown. You can still create the things though. Um, all a sparkline is, is a tiny graph. And so we can make a tiny graph and then we can save it as a super tiny graph and then we can do whatever we want with it in other programs. So what we're going to do is we'll make that India sparkline and the China sparkline. So we just want to show CO2, CO2 emissions for India um, from 1995 to 2015. So to do that, we'll make a small data set just for India. So we'll call this one India underscore CO2. This is based on the WDI clean data set. And we're going to filter it so that the country is equal to India. Um, just for fun, let me show you how you um, filter using the country code because it might, in this case, the country is India, but it might have like the official formal name of the country and we don't want to always remember that. So the column was ISO 3C which means the, the three character version of the ISO code and it should be IDN, no, IND. Hopefully that's not Indonesia. Let's check it. India CO2, that is India. Woo. Um, so yeah, we instead of filtering based on country, we filtered based on this ISO 3C code and that worked. So now we have a tiny data set with just India. We want to make a plot for it. So we're going to say ggplot. Um, we're going to use that tiny data set we have, India CO2. We're going to map year to the x-axis. So x equals year, y equals CO2 emissions. And we're going to plot this with a line, geom line. So if we look at it now, there's our line. Um, it's complaining here that there's a missing value. That's because um, there's no data on CO2 emission, emissions in 2015. It ends in 2014. So we can either live with the error uh, or that warning. We can use the, the chunk and say warning equals false and just ignore it. Or if we want to be super official, we could then add another filter here and say year is less than 2015. And that will get rid of that last row that doesn't exist. And so now we should have a nice clean line that ends at 2014. Um, so there's our plot. If we want to save this as a very, very tiny plot with no extra information in it, we're going to want to use theme void to get rid of all of the theme information. So there's no access text, there's no anything. We just have that line. Um, and then what we want to do is save this as a tiny thing. Um, so to do that, we're going to use ggsave. 
which means we need to store this as an object. So we're going to call this India plot and save it as India plot. So now I have an object called India plot. And we're going to use gg save. The file name, we're just going to call this India CO2.png. The thing we're going, the object we're going to save is India underscore plot. And then we're going to give it some dimensions. We're going to say width equals one. We'll just make it an inch wide. And the height equals, and we'll make it really tiny, like 0.15 inches. And then we'll specify the units equals inches, just so it doesn't think it's centimeters or anything. I think by default it is inches, but we'll be explicit. So if I run this now, and I go look in Finder, I should have a new tiny little picture called India CO2 that is that big. Um, and then I can drag that into Word and have it be in the middle of my text. And um, we have a sparkling. Um, and that's cool. So another thing I like to do though, is this is starting to crowd up our folder here. We have a data or a folder called data and that's where we have the data in there. Um, I generally like to create a folder called like output or graphics or graphs or charts or something. And I like to store my output in there. So it's not kind of in the same folder as the, the our markdown stuff that I'm doing. So I created that output folder and then I'm just gonna change the file name here to output slash India CO2. So now if I run it, we should now have the India CO2 graph in the output folder. We can get rid of this other one because we don't need it. So there's our output PNG file and it's our sparkling. We can go through the same process for any other country we want. If we want a China one, we really just copy this code, change every instance of India to China and save the plot. And then we have multiple sparklines. So that is how you make sparklines. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is make a slope graph. So if you remember from the lecture, a slope graph is where you take two different time periods and you plot the changes between um, observations in the first time period and the second time period. And you do that by drawing a line between them. And so you can see how things change over time. Um, so mapping that onto the grammar of graphics, what we need is something on the x-axis, like years, so like the beginning year and the ending year. We need something on the y-axis, um, like the value we care about, if it's CO2 emissions or GDP per capita or whatever we want. That's going to be on the y-axis. And then we're going to plot that by having points um, for each of the year and y-axis combinations. And then we're going to connect those with a line. And so we're going to use geom point. We're going to use geom line. We're going to use x and y. And we should be able to get a slope graph. So to do this slope graph, um, we're going to look at a specific region again instead of all 200 plus countries. Um, the region we're going to do here is South Asia. And that's only because there's like eight or nine countries there instead of 21 like in the Middle East or like 50 like there is in Africa. And so this makes it easier to work with. So we're going to make this call or make a smaller data set where we're just going to filter for only South Asia. And we'll look at GDP per capita in South Asia and how that's changed um, over this time period. So we're going to call this GDP South Asia. This is going to be again based on WDI clean. But here we're going to filter and we're going to choose the region that is equal to South Asia. So just to test, we can run this and look at GDP South Asia. So we should have Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and the Maldives and Nepal. I think those are our main countries. Yep. Cool. So now we're going to filter the data set a little bit more because all we want on the x-axis is a starting year and an ending year. We don't need all of the in-between years. So we're going to add another filter here and we're going to say year. Um, we're going to start with 1995 and we're going to end with 2015. Um, we could either say year equals 2015 comma year equals 1995. Um, or we can do what we did before with that list of countries and we can say percent in percent and then feed it a list of years, 1995 and 2015. So if we run this now and look at GDP South Asia, now we just have Afghanistan, those two years, Bangladesh, just those two years, India, just those two years, etc., um, which is good. 
um, the reason we're doing GDP per capita is because it has the most data in it. Um, CO2 emissions, there's lots of missing data, so it's gonna be really hard to plot that. Life expectancy, that's complete. GDP per capita, we're missing one for Afghanistan. Um, maybe if we switch this to 2014, they have GDP per capita. Nope, they've quit recording GDP per capita. So in our final plot, we're not gonna see Afghanistan. Um, we can actually get rid of it. So we'll say filter country not equal to Afghanistan. And that way when we plot things, it won't give us any warnings about missing data because we got rid of the missing data. So now we dropped Afghanistan. So it's just Bangladesh through Pakistan. Okay. So next, what we're going to do is modify one last thing here and then we'll start making or start building the slope graph um, because like the x-axis is just going to have a start year and an end year and we want to treat those not as numbers anymore we want to treat those as categories essentially so that we have two separate categories at the bottom beginning and end they happen to have numeric names 1995 and 2015 um, but they're not actually numbers. Like we're not gonna have the possibility of having something in between like 2000 or 2006 um, because we've gotten rid of those. So we're going to mutate and we're gonna make year a factor. That's our way of making it a category. So we're gonna say year equals factor year. Okay, so now we're ready to start building this thing. So we want ggplot. Our data is GDP South Asia. Our aesthetics are going to be um, so AES X equals year, Y equals, what did we call it? It's slightly different from the gap minor data. GDP underscore per underscore cap is what we want to show. So GDP underscore per underscore cap. And that's all we're going to do for now. Uh, we do actually, we do want to color it by country so that we have multiple lines. If we don't do that, we're going to run into the same problem we did before, where we have a single line that's just kind of zigzagging across all of the countries and the values. So we do want a color um, for country. And then we want geom point for each of the points. And we want geom line to connect the starting and the ending points. So if we run that, we should get a graph that looks something like that. And we do not have, so we have the dots, but we do not have any lines, um, which is a problem. And the reason we don't have lines is because um, this year variable down here is a factor. These are categories. And so ggplot doesn't actually know that it's supposed to draw a line across categories. It doesn't typically want you to do that. Um, like if you have like a, a Likert scale at the bottom that's like strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, etc. Um, typically don't want to have a, a line connecting each of those categories because those are distinct categories. And so it, it dissuades you from doing that. If we want to actually connect these things, it gives us a hint here. It says each group consists of only one observation. Do you need to adjust the group aesthetic? The group aesthetic is an aesthetic like all the others, like it's size or line type or color or fill, but it's an invisible aesthetic. It actually doesn't do anything. Um, it doesn't show up. The only thing it does is it tells ggplot to consider, um, it, it lets ggplot draw lines across categories. It's essentially pretty much the only time you're ever gonna use it. So if we say group equals country here in the aesthetics, that will make it so that lines get drawn across the categories like that. And now we have a slope graph, um, a very basic slope graph. And like we want, um, we probably want some labels on here. As you'll read uh, in the readings tomorrow, um, it's generally a bad idea to have a legend off to the side when you have a whole bunch of colors like this. It's a really bad idea to have a legend that's out of order here. Um, we would probably want to put Maldives first because they're at the top here, and then Sri Lanka, and then Bhutan, and then India, and have this legend here match up with the order of the lines here because um, that helps with interpretation. Um, or we can put the labels directly on the plot and get rid of the, the legend completely, which is what we're going to do um, because that makes life a lot easier. So to do that, we can add another geom here called geom text. And geom text, as you'll learn in, a, I think, tomorrow when we talk about annotations, it has one specific 
new aesthetic that we can add called label, um, where it will put the text um, that's in the data set as, a, as text on the plot. So if we say label equals country, what we will get is the country names directly on the plot, like that. So now we can see Maldives and Maldives, Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Bhutan, hooray. Um, now we have this double encoding thing going on. We can get rid of the color legend because we don't need it anymore. We have the, the labels directly on the graph. So if we come back to our plot and say guides color equals false and then run it again, we should now have no legend and that looks great. Okay, we can do a couple other things here um, to improve this. Right now it's it's, it says Maldives at the beginning and Maldives at the end. It would be really cool if we could have the actual values here and we could put kind of the actual amount of GDP per capita in this year and in this year and have that directly on the plot. Um, we can do that if we modify our, our smaller data set and add a column for that. Because again, with geom text, what we're doing is we're mapping one of our columns onto the plot as text. And so we have a column called country and so we're showing that on here. So if we create a new column called like fancy label, um, we can create we can concatenate different values in our data set um, to kind of combine the country name with the actual GDP per capita in a new column and then show that on the plot. So let's do that. If we come back up to GDP South Asia, we're going to mutate and we're going to make a new variable called nice label um, left. So this is the label that's going to go on the left side here. Um, this is going to be equal to a concatenation or a combination of a whole bunch of different things in our data set. The way we do this in R is there's a function called paste zero. And what this does is you feed it just a whole bunch of things like strings um, and it will combine them. So let me show you a really quick example down here in the console. If I say paste zero and then I have apple and banana and something that starts with a C, a cherry? Sure. If I run this, it will connect them all like this, apple, banana, cherry, with no spaces in between. That's what this paste zero means. There's also a paste that you can use, and what that does is it will insert a space in between each of those things. Um, I typically don't use paste because I like to build things that might have like the name of the country, colon, and then the value of GDP. If I use paste zero, it's going to put a space right before the colon, and I don't want that. I want the colon to be right up against the, the country name. So I don't want um, paste normally. I like to use paste zero. So what we're gonna do is we want to paste things together. So if we come back to the data set, we want the country. So we're going to say paste country, and then we're going to add a colon and a space, and then we're going to add the GDP per capita. So we'll say GDP per cap, spelled correctly. Okay, so if I run this now, and we come back to our data set and look over at the side, we now have our nice label. But it's not quite nice because like we have the country name colon, that's cool. Um, but this is ugly. Um, we have GDP per capita, but then we have like an infinite number of decimal points, and we don't want that. So we can round that um, but we also, we're trying to make this a nice looking plot. We want to put a comma here after the one, have one comma zero zero two. Um, and we want to put a dollar sign in front of these because this is um, measured in US dollars. So if we could format these things as dollars, um, that would make a really nice plot and it would look great. Um, we've worked with this before. There's a package called scales. So if we open library or if we include library scales, now we have access to a function called dollar, and it will format any number we feed it as a dollar, and it'll put a dollar sign, and it'll put the commas where it needs to, be, where they need to be, and it will automatically round things, which is nice. Um, so, if we come here, we're going to say dollar GDP per capita. So it's going to combine the country name, a colon, a space, and then the dollar version of GDP per capita. So if we run that and look at it now with uh, GDP South Asia, and we scroll over. There we go. There's Bangladesh's GDP per capita. There's everybody else's that worked great. Um, 
we don't want those decimals though because we don't want to be like so hyper specific about the GDP per capita. We don't care about the 39 cents or the 62 cents here. So there are a couple ways of, of fixing that. Um, one easy way is instead of um, getting the dollar version of GDP per capita, we can actually round GDP per capita to zero decimal places. Um, so then we will get the dollar version of the rounded version of GDP per capita. And so now if we look at it, now we don't have the decimals there because we cut the decimals off by rounding it and then we converted it to a dollar. So that's good. Okay, one last thing we want to do here though is this, we want this label to be on the left side. Um, on the right side, we just want to have the, the dollar amount, but we don't want the country name. So we need to make another column here. So we'll just do mutate again, and we'll say nice label right equals, and we don't really need to paste anything. We can just say dollar version of the rounded version of GDP per capita and to zero decimal places. Okay, so now if we look at this, oh, it's not rounded, it's just round. So now if we look at this, um, we should have two columns at the end with nice label that's going to go on the left and nice label that's going on the right. Um, so let's go ahead and put those on. If we come down to the data set or to the ggplot thing, we have geom text. We want to label using um, nice label left. And then we also want to add our nice label right. And so if I run it now, we should get our nice labels. But you should see a problem pretty quick. Um, it's overlaying both of those labels. It doesn't know that these labels only go on the left side and these labels only go on the right side. Um, we have both of the labels happening on both sides and that's not great. So what we have to do is um, change this data set here. The reason it's showing both is because it's looking through and it says Bangladesh 1002 goes on there. Um, and then 1002 goes on there because it's there. So what we have to do is turn one of these things off. Um, so um, the first row is 1995. So we want this to actually show up in 1995, but then we don't want this to show up in 2005. Um, we want that to go away um, or the other way around. We, um, yeah, so we want this, um, do I have them backwards? Bangladesh. That should be right. Yeah, so we essentially just want to get rid of every other one of these so it's not showing both at the same time. So what we can do to do that is use an if else statement inside mutate here. So instead of making the whole column show this nice cleaned up version of the label, we can make only some of the rows show that nice label. So if we, at the beginning of paste zero here, we can say if else, if the year is equal to 2015 or to 1995, then do this pasting stuff. And then we have to count parentheses here. Otherwise, don't put anything. That's the NA means missing. So what's going to happen here is if the year is 1995, then do the fancy formatting. Otherwise, don't do anything. And so if we run this now, and look at our data set. We should see now that we have Bangladesh starting at 460 and there's nothing here in 2015 because it has that one first, that's why. So for an nice label right, we wanna get rid of these rows here and we only wanna keep the rows where it's 2015 and we want missing values um, where we have the, the left label. So to do that, we do the same if else thing. And um, we say if else, year is equal to 2015, then do the dollar version of the rounded version of GDP per capita. Otherwise, don't put anything. So if we run that now and we come to GDP South Asia, now we have a label for the right and a label for the left and it alternates every other one, which is what we want. So now if we plot it, we should get only the labels we care about. So we have Maldives colon, the actual GDP, and then the actual GDP. And that looks cool. It's complaining about missing values, um, but that's because we purposely made missing values. We got rid of 
um, like half of the values here in GDP South Asia, we know those are missing. And so we can actually just turn those warnings off because we know. So if we come up here and say warning equals false, that's fine. We did that on purpose. Okay, a couple final tweaks we can do to this. Um, this is still kind of ugly. We have text on there, but the text is right on top of the points and gets lost um, down here where there's a whole bunch of different um, countries all overlaid on each other. It'd be great if we could move all of these out to the side and move all of these out to the side um, so that we can actually read the text. So to do that, the easiest way is to use a function called gg label or gg text repel. Um, there's a package, if we come back up to the top, called library gg repel. And you'll get more practice with this tomorrow um, when we talk about annotations in text. Um, but what gg repel does is it gives you a new version of geom text called geom text repel. And what this will do is it will make sure none of the text labels overlap with each other. And it will move them out of the way. And if it has to move it too far, it'll actually draw a little line to where it's supposed to go. So if we look at it now, we should see a plot that looks like this. So now nothing's overlapping. And we can actually read all of these different countries. They're still overlapping with the points. Um, but they're not overlapping with the text. So we can still see Pakistan, we can still see India, Bangladesh, etc. So that's an improvement, um, which is good. Another improvement we can make is we can choose which direction these things get randomly placed. The geom text repel kind of works like geom jitter or the position jitter, where it kind of shuffles the, the points around on the, on the plot. So here it's shuffling around all over the place to make it fit. We can tell it to only shuffle around in one direction. We want it to just go up and down. We don't want it to go um, side to side. So it's still going to be kind of stuck in that column, but they're all going to be stacked in different ways vertically. So to do that, we change one of the arguments in geom text repel, and we say direction equals lowercase y. And we'll do this one here too. Direction equals y. So now if we plot it, we have text or the text is still back onto our points and our lines, which we don't want. That's ugly, but it's not overlapping with anything. Um, everything's been kind of shuffled vertically, which is good. Um, so the last thing we can do is we can actually force all of this text to either go out this way or on this side, we want all the text to go that way. And that's another argument inside geom repel called nudge x, nudge underscore underscore x. So what this will do is it will move the x values for all of these labels in some direction. So if we say nudge x equals negative one, it's going to move all of these labels one unit this way. Um, let's see what that looks like. Like that. So everything just got moved over to the side by one unit and it fits in the plot still. Everything is in the right order here. Nothing's on top of each other and that's all readable. We can do the same thing for 2015. Um, we don't want to nudge negative one because that's going to move them to the middle. We can nudge positive one and it should move them off to the side. So after direction, we can say nudge underscore x equals one. And we should have a nice slope graph there with actual labels on there. Nothing's stacked on top of each other. You can read everything and that's really cool. Um, one graphical thing I would do um, these little lines that point to the points, that's the same size as the points that are actually showing the slopes. And so I would make um, here in geom line, I'd say like size equals three, maybe, or two. We'll make those a little bit thicker to help distinguish between the actual slope that we care about and then that guideline. So that helps us see stuff better. Um, we can get rid of some of the plot elements here. Um, because we don't need that gray background. Because we actually have the labels on here, we don't need the axis anymore. Um, so we could actually go um, nuclear and say theme underscore void, get rid of everything. And we should get a very minimalist slope graph showing change in GDP per capita in South Asia, which is really cool. It's got all of the information that we need on there. It has the names, it has the values, it has the slopes. So you can see which, cha which countries change the most. Um, that was the Maldives. Um, which countries changed the least? That looks like it was Pakistan. That's pretty flat over time. 
Um, and that's a slope graph. And that's pretty cool. If you look on the course website, there's also an example of how you make a bump chart, which is essentially a slope graph, but with instead of just two categories, it's a whole bunch of categories. And so if you look at the, the example, it's a slope or a bump chart of rankings of CO2 emissions in South Asia. And so you can see like Afghanistan, they're the best at CO2 emissions. Um, they dropped down to second place in 2008 and were overtaken by Nepal, who then became the best. And then Nepal and um, Afghanistan switched. You can trace India, who started off at four. And then by the time they got to 2014, they're down in sixth place. And so you kind of see changes in rankings over time with these bump charts. Um, the code for doing that and the explanation of how to do all of that is on the course website. So check that out. And um, all of this stuff should be really helpful as you do your assignment and your exercise. You'll get practice making these things, and it should be fun. So good luck with that.